some of the questions, here, here's some, thank you, have to do with the term of jihad <laughs> and uh, its various meanings. So I think it would be important to, to comment on that. Uh, a number of people ask about that, and it's obviously used in the media in certain ways, used in different ways by people. Um, then there's a cluster of questions on which a widely circulated idea that somehow in the Quran it said that if you uh, are not a Muslim, then you're an infidel, and that, that somehow you're an evil person, and uh, even that, that it's all right to do harm to people who are, who are not Muslims or infidels. Um, so that's another couple of uh, clusters of questions. So I'll, I'll just put those two on the table and, and, uh, and get your responses to those. So I, I would say, um, to take the pop culture reference to absurdity, uh, how many of you have seen Walking Dead TV show AMC? Nice. If you haven't seen it, I'm not endorsing it, but you should see it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the, the reason I'm, I'm drawing attention to it is, is really, and, and I want to be reasonably efficient with this, is I Islam was born in a context where people lived on the margins of, of existence, right? This was a harsh desert society in which most people lived very difficult lives. Early Muslims were incredibly poor. Uh, rarely had more than one meal a day. Uh, that's the reality of the society they lived in with a limited food supply. Uh, when we look at jihad, I'm not going to sugarcoat it and say that there is no component of jihad uh, in, in the history of Islam that had you know, a military component. Of course, there have been uh, you know, understandings of jihad you know, throughout Muslim history that have a military component. That's not the primary component, but that's there, and that's what people are asking. What Islam always set out to do was to make everyday human life more moral more compassionate, more productive, more humane, but to do so within the reality that existed at the time. Uh, the problem that we get is that people take verses out of the Quran and then just assume that they must therefore hold for all time and all places. Uh, nobody does that in the Muslim tradition. Uh, in the Muslim tradition, the Quran itself has not been traditionally read outside the context of the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And the two exist you know, together. So the verse that I'm sure is being uh, alluded to is, is a verse in the Quran that says, kill them wherever you find them, right? And so people say, well, this must mean that Muslims have to go kill infidels wherever they find them, right? But if you look at the first uh, statement in the history of Muslim just war theory, the first speech after the life of the prophet, the prophet's best friend, who's the leader of the Muslim community, goes in front of his troops and says, don't attack anyone deceitfully or treacherously. Don't harm civilians, don't harm crops, don't touch people in houses of worship or in monastic orders, right? If that's how they were speaking, right, then clearly they're not just taking verses out of context and applying them without any sort of larger vision. And the way Islam makes sense to Muslims, like any other religious tradition, is as a totality. If you, you know, lift little pieces out of it here and there, you can find ugly things. I mean, you can do that with the Constitution, right? Take the three-fifths clause, right? If you forget <laughs> the fact that there's an amendment after that that's modifying it, I mean, you're, you're not looking at the whole picture, and I think that's, that's a problem that we have, is that, again, we're looking at things in isolation, and that's not how people live their faith, uh, and that's not how Muslims have understood their faith. And <laughs> I'd, I'd just say that, you know, sometimes it's, you feel uh, this kind of eerie sense when you hear someone talk about another faith because it reminds you of battles in your own faith. And, of course, uh, Baptists are known for battling over Scripture, and uh, there's something that we call proof texting, where you take out one piece of scripture and try to say that it means uh, something and you don't try to think about, for example, the, the whole message of Jesus Christ and how that fits into the Christian gospel as a whole. So these kinds of things happen in many faith traditions where a, a particular piece is plucked out of scripture. If someone's trying to uh, cast aspersions on a faith, uh, some, some verse that uh, can sound very bad, isolated, from the rest of scripture. And so it's a thing that often happens, um, it, it particularly when people are trying to cast aspersions against a faith. And it is important instead to look at the totality of the teaching of a faith and to listen to proponents of that faith to describe it in order to understand it as an authentic uh, religion. <laughs>